Cool. Mr. Coleman, how are you getting on? Not too bad, Mr. O'Connor. Good, uh, good. Thanks for taking the time to sit down and chat to me. And uh, I know life is quite strange at the moment. We were only sort of mentioning it offline there, but uh, I think it's good to get the community together and have a chat and talk about what we actually enjoy doing instead of, you know, how the world is going to end or whatever, right? So. Sure, that's good. Positive note. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, look, uh, I suppose the way we start this is the same way we start with everybody. You know, firstly, how are you getting on with the whole shutdown and how is it affecting your school and yourself and so on and so forth? And I hope you're keeping well and all of that as well, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, I mean, directly it has affected me uh, with the club for sure. Um, uh, the clubs are closed now. We have two clubs, one in Sligo and one in Eastkey. Uh, the one in Eastkey, uh, Miss McCutcheon, uh, is uh, primarily looking after at the moment, but both are closed now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like things happen, you got to adapt. So what we have done is we have gone down the road of doing Zoom live classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's working out well. The members are, are happy enough with that. So, yeah, I mean, that's in Taekwondo. That's kind of what's happening. Uh, outside of that, other types of things like work I'm it's moved to basically working from home so I haven't been affected like many people have mm-hmm. um, too directly with that and um, my wife has lost all her work because she's a she's a singer and that kind of thing um but uh yeah you just 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 kind of rolling with it you know uh, day yeah. by day yeah and it's it's something that uh, everyone I've talked about this said the same thing it's like it's it's unfortunate but what can you do you just gotta gotta get on with it and you know it's interesting seeing the clubs around the country adapt to it, you know, um, and I noticed yourself straight away was one of the ones that jumped out at me running the, the live stream classes on Zoom was one of the things that jumped out at me. You know, we've been doing live classes on Instagram and stuff as well and YouTube live and stuff just running through it. It's a strange feeling though, isn't it? Teaching to a camera. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely strange. Just there's so many instructors out there who are doing a great job. Uh, like recording classes some people doing live classes some people doing the, the zoom thing um it's great to, i mean there's so much technology out there that's kind of underutilized i mean when all this uh hopefully ends in a few months time you know how many uh, great kind of concepts could you use having online classes and maybe getting uh, some of the the heads from internationals like uh, mm-hmm. Poland or that kind of thing doing doing little kind of seminars online there's so much you can do you know yeah so I think um, we're really we're really seeing uh, the innovation come out of the out of the martial arts community with this sort of stuff um, it's really it's really cool to see and like you say what will it bring in the future is another thing but also I think from a kind of pragmatic point of view like I mean it's really important for clubs to keep a presence with their members because if this drags out for another couple of months you know, people will forget, people will sort of go, oh, I don't know, and maybe not come back. And how much do you stand to lose out of that as a club just by you know, sheer lack of participation, right? Yeah, absolutely. Trying to keep any kind of touch point you have with your members is very important, for sure. Which, whatever way you do it, you know, I mean, there's still some people out there who are more tech savvy, some people are less tech savvy. Uh, so you've just got to do what you could do. That's um, true. Yeah. That's true. So, I mean, like, let's 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 sort of shoot the breeze a little bit about uh, yourself and your journey through Taekwondo and how you got to where you are and what you got to do. And, uh, you know, I know it'd be it's fascinating. I don't know an awful lot about your, your own journey. So, like, why don't you tell me how you got to or how you got involved in Taekwondo and why? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's an interesting uh, story. I, I didn't start Taekwondo until secondary school. So I was in just coming out of fourth year, going into fifth year. Um, and uh, it, it's li- literally how I discovered Taekwondo was I was having a kind of a best fight with one of my friends in school. <laughs> he threw a 360 uh, turning kick, jumping 360 turning kick, and I was like, uh, where'd you learn how to do that? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I do Taekwondo. I was like, what? And I'd known for about maybe three years at this stage, I was like, you do Taekwondo? And he's like, yeah, I'm a blue belt. I was like, well, I never knew that. It wouldn't so have he, jumped you had I known such things. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it kind of, it started there. I was just, we were just having a crack one day in school. And then um, I rounded up, I think about eight of my pals. And we went down to his club when they had a beginner class on. And these these would be all about, you know, kind of teenagers, a uh, few people a bit younger, like my brother. 
Mm -hmm. I was around 16 at that that, that time, you know. Which is rare, right? Because you don't get an awful lot of teenagers walking in, let alone a gang of eight to a class. That's, I'd say the instructor didn't know what to do, which is... Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was funny when when we all came in, for sure. Um, Now, I mean, like, like, like the story goes, I think with any martial art, you know, not everybody lasts, uh, for sure. But um, yeah, when we all came in the door that first class, it was quite, it was quite funny. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) And where were you, where were you training when this started? Or how did you, where, where, where were you in the world when you were training? So I, I'm a dub originally, so I'm from Dublin. And, um. My first uh, Taekwondo school was in Temple Oak uh, with Master uh, Val Douglas yeah. uh, in the INTA. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's where I uh, that's where I kind of started, and I, I pretty much was primarily training with uh, Master Douglas up until my first dan okay. uh, black belt, and uh, I kind of when like I, I started competing quite early. I, I was really I was really into it. Uh, really into the sparring side of it. Yeah. Uh, went to Belgium uh, as a kind of a yellow belt and stuff, um, and that was a real sort of uh, like I, I had competed, let's say, in a couple of national competitions, mm-hmm. um, and I did okay. I just got like second place, third place, first place, a few few spars. You know, nothing that was really that I was finding very hard. And then we went to Belgium, and we all got. Uh, fairly knocked around the color belts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was one or two black belts who, who were who were quite good at that time. Um, um, a guy called Kieran Ryan. Uh, he was a black belt, a young black belt. Um, he was an excellent uh, athlete, mm. and uh, he was there and he he, he did quite well. Um, but us as color belts, it was a bit of a struggle. It's an eye opener that first international, isn't it? That first international was definitely an eye opener. Yeah, we get like I just remember back then. I mean, it's similar now in terms of who or what countries are uh, producing great, I suppose, uh, taekwondo athletes. But the the Netherlands, uh, they were amazing color belts, as mm. uh, and also uh, Poland. Uh, yeah. They were the two that that really, at that time, um, so this would have been back in, I suppose, 2003, 2004, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, re- real, real eye-opener. Um but that, that was my journey um, with, with him primarily. Then I did a, a lot of uh, training as well. Um, I used to, in, um, uh, and then another coach, um, now master, Nigel Stobie uh, as well. So they were kind of the, the main kind of coaches for me, up to first time black belt anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, training through then and somehow you end up uh, in Sligo running a club. How does, how does that happen? Yeah, okay. So I suppose I might take from when I got my first time black belt. Yeah, or, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, because that kind of leads into that. So I got my first time black belt and I was really, um, I, I, I was I was training a, a lot then. I was like, I got to get on the team, right? right and at right. that time, the team uh, was pretty much, I think, uh, under the ITA at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started training in um, uh, Mr. Donahue's club. So I was training, training his club. Mm-hmm. I was doing a lot of my own training, and I was really trying really, really hard for about a year, mm-hmm. uh, and then the rest of my life took over. So, right. uh, so yeah, uh, college and all that kind of stuff. So I stopped training basically yeah. uh, at that point for a couple of years. Uh, college, few qualifications. I ended up here because my wife's from Sligo. I moved to Sligo. Wanted to take up a bit of. Uh, taekwondo training again looked around no clubs at that time in the three hour yeah. radius yeah yeah it's like well i'll do it myself so yeah right, cool and that's pretty much how i ended up setting up here yeah yeah because i mean you, you're really you're you're a real outlier in the ita do you know what i mean the sense of where you're located I know, you know yeah. uh it's there's there's like even from an examiner's point of view like i mean to run gradings and stuff like that, that must be uh have to be planned well in advance for a trip to Sligo for somebody. Yeah, so um, at my currently I still keep up my own training uh, when I'm mm-hmm. in Dublin. So I work in Dublin during the week. Well, I did Some more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I worked in Dublin during the week, um, and um, uh, Mr. Uh, Doherty uh, yeah. in uh, Santry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he's an excellent. Uh, excellent instructor excellent coach and he he has come down and done our, our senior gradings for us Super, yeah. uh, so he's he's making the the journey down and um 
yeah, I, I, it's great. I, I do one class a week when I'm up there. It's it's a sparring class, um, so I'm still keeping my foot in doing and doing my own training at home as well. But you know yourself, it can be a challenge when you have everything going. For sure, when you have everything going and you have a family and a life and a kid and a job and a you know uh, yeah. whatever else it might be, right? You know, a uh, house to Hoover, um, you know, <laughs> exactly. finding a way to be an instructor and do your own training as well can be really really difficult. I know I've certainly struggled with the. Uh, finding that time to make my own my own training you know um i'm lucky in many ways that you know i can still train in greystones with master weekly very close to me you know uh so i can i, I always get a, a bit in there somehow whenever i can but it's that it's that in and out bits and then you know even I, i've been caught with injuries recently as well so that that kind of stops you and, and being being doing treating them correctly is just such a nuisance sometimes and you always end up going back too soon and so forth and so on but look that's my own problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've I've had it. I had a actually got a pretty bad injury in my neck when I came back down here, and it took me about a year to come come back and recover. So bad to the point where I couldn't do any push-ups. Uh, it was it was kind of down the. Remember exactly the, the muscle it was, but it, I spent thousands trying to get it fixed, and it took yeah. ages to get it back up. But thankfully now it's it's right as right. But it's the worst thing when you're back in it, you have a bit of momentum, and yeah. then all of a sudden you get derailed. Hit. <laughs> it's a nuisance. It is a nuisance. Yeah, it's hard. Um, but look, it's part of the it's part of the game as you as you go up through the grades and stuff. I remember when I was a color belt and there was a black belt said to me, "No, it's basically just injuries from here on out." <laughs> 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 Don't sugarcoat okay. it. Like, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, fine. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, you know, he's that's nonsense. It can't be that way. He's yeah, and sure enough, here we are. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, so tell me, tell me, like, so I mean, you start the club in Sligo. How did you? What was the 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 reaction to that? Like, I mean. Because you, you, I've seen the club, you're kind of more prevalent on the on the scene now. With the uh, with it, it, it from a competition point of view, I see you out there a lot, and I see you all over Instagram and stuff like that as well. So, um, obviously you got good uptake on that. And was that how, how did you do that, or how what was your thought process? Okay, so um, my thought process. Okay, so um. So setting up the club, I mean, it's, it's like, I suppose, any kind of small business, you have to try and approach it um, and really think about it. You don't just go, I'm opening a club, put it up, and then hope people come, right? Mm. So um, for from the what I did was I, I ran classes for a month for free uh, in the premises, uh, like actual taekwondo classes, maybe a little shorter than I would usually run them, so <clears throat> about 40, 45 minutes. Yeah. And I would have... Um, juniors and seniors together so when i did that and i had free classes the first class that we had i promoted it all over social media for a couple of weeks mm-hmm. uh with a friend of mine did a few little clips of a few mm-hmm. little things what it would be like and we had i'd, I'd say there was about 50 people then at uh, that first class uh, and they most of them stayed for that month which was great and this is before any monetary exchange was going on right. so um but then in September, like this was through August, I did these free classes in September. Then I said, okay, so this is the fee structure and all that kind of stuff. And a good few of them um, stayed around. I'd say, I'd say it, was a, it was a full club, basically, from that first September. Yeah. So we had about 20 juniors and uh, 25 seniors in Sligo. And did uh, you split? Did you split that class straight away, or? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah junior yeah. seniors, like yeah. So what sort of grades do you? Or do you do you split your class by grade or by age now, or how do you do that? primarily now it's by grade okay. so most of my members are now yellow belts and we have mm-hmm. a not few green belts mm-hmm. um, age wise i'm not taking i don't take anybody in anymore that's um under seven so okay. i had a separate class for tigers kind of thing before yeah. for me it just wasn't really working out the way that i wanted it to so i decided that i would stop that Mm-hmm. Uh, and just focus on juniors uh, and seniors. So that's that's what we we do at the moment. Well, when I say we. There's there's two instructors basically. So yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's interesting because a lot of a lot of instructors would go the complete other way and go. I'm 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 just teaching the sort of four, five, six, seven bracket up, and you know I don't have an adults beginners class. Do you know? Did you yeah. find did you find good uptake on the adult side of it on the beginners? Because I run an adults beginners class and it's one of my busier classes now. You know. Yeah, I, at the start, I mean, that was busier than the junior class, you know. Mm. Uh, now, I mean, it's not as busy now, for sure, but we have we have a, 
like a kind of a dedicated few who 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 ha- have stayed through the last few years, you know that kind of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but for me, I, I suppose it, it, this really depends. I think about it, it really depends on whether uh, you're doing uh, it as a living or whether you're doing it as as something as in terms of a. Uh, a, a sport or, or something that you want to keep in your life for some other mm. reason. It, 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 there's two different things. So, like for me personally, I'm not doing doing the club for a living. Yeah. So I, I suppose I have the the kind of I can kind of make that choice. Yeah, that that yeah, choice yeah. doesn't it doesn't really affect whether the club still functions or not. If, if that makes any sense. You know? Yeah. 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 No. It um, does. Yeah, so because uh, there's just too much pressure with everything else going on with work and, and all the other stuff. So um, having a juniors and seniors class was definitely the, the, the way to go for myself. Do you see yourself pivoting at all in the future to do it full time? No. No, it's it's always going to be a, a, a separate thing to your commercial endeavors. Uh, yes. And I suppose I could maybe digress about this slightly why I, I would choose that. Um, so... I spent quite a lot of time as a full-time musician. You're as a, pre- preaching to the choir here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know yourself as well. Based. So I spent a long, long time in college studying that, uh, and I spent a long, long time as a full-time musician and drum teacher, bit of a piano teacher. And I kind of hit a plateau with that, um, whereby it, I felt like that it wouldn't really change. Mm. So kind of... Uh, yeah, so for me, I was losing all the enjoyment out of the art, right? Okay, oh, yeah. so the art then was like, okay, so I'm not enjoying this anymore. Uh, I need to figure out something else that maybe I can do so that I can enjoy the art. And the same thing for me applies to Taekwondo. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's I, I have the, I, a near carbon copy story to, you, you know, I mean, gigging and training and producing music for years and years and years. And I know that frustration of trying to make your life around something that's as unstable as that, you know. Um, so it is one of the things that we always talk about here. It's like, you know, we talk about going full time and it's like, you know, well, remember when you did the music full time and eventually you ended up hating that thing you put 10 years of your life into? Yeah. I mean, it's not that I ended up hating music and stuff. I still play all the time and it's great crack. But uh, it is. I know what you mean. I'm, I'm very because I'm, I'm similar to you in that I don't run. My, I'm not dependent on my club to be my income, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it does, like you say, it gives you that freedom to not have to make it make it work all the time. You know, you're allowed to experiment with it a little bit. Um, yeah, but and again, I suppose it, just to clarify, because I know people listen to it, like this is only a it's a personal choice. You know, it's not to say mm. that you shouldn't. No, like, no, no, there's not at all. Plenty of people who do it out there full time uh, and do a fantastic job of it. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I I know from the music that if I was to 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 do this full time that I would end up not enjoying it as much as I do now. And that's really important, is that if you don't enjoy what you're doing, it's never going to last. You need to have a, an enjoyment factor coming back for yourself, otherwise it just burn out. So it's very important. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I think that's true across life, not just in martial arts or music, right? Yes, for sure. <laughs> it's uh, one of the things that I always sort of think about um the you know uh, the, how relatable that is to 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 to, a, to your actual training right you know i mean because i get it all the time and i'm sure you do it's like oh you know sir i i don't like sparring or sir i don't really enjoy patterns or whatever it might be can i not do this part of it and you know there's a little bit of you know well no this is what we do right you know and so you're gonna have to find a way to enjoy this side or else you know you're not and that'll be it and this isn't for you right you know and yeah. I think that's just a really nice philosophy that rings true all the time. Like, um, um, so yeah, I mean, so tell me more about how you, uh, if I mean, so how's, how are you placing the club in in your brain then? I mean, is it a, are you going to drive it as a competitive club to try and breed black belts that will go and be national fighters or are you, is it just a place to come for people to train and, and, you know, if they succeed, they can succeed in their own right and they, you'll support them throughout that endeavor. How, how, what, what's your, what's the, what's the purpose yeah. of it, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. And uh, I suppose the answer when I started was I was, it was fluid. It was to see what would kind of evolve. Mm. And, um, from the very first competition where I entered my students in, 
uh, onto the mats uh, and you know like performing chunji mm. uh, on the mats mm. the the buzz of seeing them perform and do well mm. and bring home medals is uh, it's it's a very difficult uh, feeling to put into words so it was a, it was an amazing uh, feedback feeling because yeah. I, I I and again I'm we're a young club we're up about three years but when you see them on the mats it's a real positive feedback for yourself because it's either they go up and they do well or they go up and they don't do well and if you see them doing well you're kind of going okay so what I've been actually doing with them for the last three years you know there's some sort of evolution there and progress mm. and that's a great uh, that's a great feeling like as a, as a as a coach or an instructor for that to happen so for me i get a real buzz from entering the students in and seeing them uh, step up on the mats it's not about necessarily the winning aspect of it but no. it, it's when they even say their first competition and they they you know uh, my favorite thing is sometimes at a grading you'll ask um ask the, the younger students where does taekwondo come from you mm. know and they'll be looking around they go sligo you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. and it's it's so funny because it it they are they just don't see anything else except their club you know yeah, yeah. and then they go to these competitions and they go wow look at all this these whole people. world yeah yeah and then they see the different levels and they go in and, and they, you know, that that's the kind of thing that it just gives me a great, a great, uh, a great buzz seeing them there um, and coaching, the coaching the sparring. And yeah, it's, I mean, I suppose we're, we're young, we're small, but I definitely do encourage competition. Uh, yeah, I definitely do. Yeah, I think it's great sounding board. It's a great uh, measure of where you're at. You know, there's no. Uh, it's a, it's a really good way to test your own your, yourself against the standard that you should be at. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, you know, cream rises to the co- top and all of that. So, um, and like you, I, I'd be very much the same. We don't, you know, I, I encourage students to go and compete and be involved in it. And, and I would echo your enthusiasm for that enjoyment of watching, you know, I've been on the sidelines, yeah. you know, and sort of not coaching, uh, but, you know, maybe shouting instructions to people. <laughs> yeah. you know? Um but it's a it's it's a great it's a it's a great feeling to see that that like you say that feedback loop that yeah. this the, the product of the work that you're putting into these people and the work that they're doing you know um it's it's a really good thing to see um but I mean so there's also I suppose just on that like the ITA tournaments you know I mean the the quality of the other clubs right I mean yeah. you see see and it's like I. I remember if we just skip back to my first international competition and the level was so much, so different then, um, then uh, in terms of the, it, the Irish level seemed to be so different then, than it is now. Yeah. Like now it, it's like they are at that top level. And then you go and do these national competitions where you have all these phenomenal athletes and mm. phenomenal juniors and phenomenal seniors. It's very inspiring to see yeah. as a coach and then also as the, the students get to see that level of competition it's like well right wow well, okay that's that's the bar right yeah and i mean you're dead right the standard in ireland is 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 high and you know there's no easy medals in any division you know i mean i, I sometimes look at the sort of eight-year-old yellow belt sparring and guys winning it have gone through like a thousand matches yeah. to win a medal and then there's like black belts with you know divisions of three and you know it's two rounds and that's that you know um yeah. but uh it's 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 insane like the standard and i mean the volume of it it's, you know it's testament to the work that the ita tournament committee are doing and the way it's organized and it is so well organized the way in is done and the, the way your sticker is issued and there's no confusion and you know because I, I mean i remember the old tournaments where you'd get there on saturday and you might leave on wednesday you know <laughs> like and you just wait to be called and if you missed your call that was that tough look um yeah go on home but it is uh yeah it, like i said it's a testament to the work that the tournament committee are doing so if uh, uh, so like t- talk to me about it if i if i was if i was going to, to to train with you in your class how what would a what would a standard class look like in sligo when i walk in i mean for senior grades how do you do you plan your lessons out how do you plan your lessons how do you sort of organize your curriculum is it ad hoc or is it very much we know what's going to happen for the next month week day hour is it minute planning or 
how do, how do you lay that out? So, um, I would consider myself the lead instructor in Sligo, and Miss McCutcheon would be considered the lead instructor in Eski. Cool. So, my planning and her planning is uh, will be slightly different now. And do the students cross over at all? Yeah, so we have a squad training class. Uh, it's like every couple of Sundays. It's not a regular thing, but mm. it's usually mm. coming up the competitions mm. where we have our uh, people who, anyone who's a yellow belt or above who's interested in competing comes to the squad session. It's free. It doesn't cost them any money. That's cool. So they come to this squad session and the training is a little bit harder, basically. Mm. And it's longer. Uh, we cover uh, both technical and sparring in that class. Um, mm. We sort of, um, and this kind of, this will come back to the class plan question. We sort of have a, a general rule, which is that pe- people before they go into a national competition will do a developmental competition so we have three developmental competitions interclub throughout the year and that's again where Sligo and Eastern will come together um, and they get a good few spars good few good few pattern uh, competitions a uh, bit of special technique so they get a bit of a feel for it first you know I think that's really important we do something very similar in in, in out in Carrig we run a, like a, what we call a summer blitz yeah. And when the competition season is over and there's nothing happening in the summer and people are, you know, looking for stuff to do, we run a sort of development tournament like that. And it's, you know, a lit capped at green belt and it's open to all grades and clubs or sorry, up to green belt. Yeah. And you come and it's like you say, it's it's patterns and sparring and spec tech. And we actually did power as well with the rebreakable boards and stuff like that. Uh-huh. It was great crack, you know, and they're always good adventures. And you see the difference then when they go to the national tournament with 800 people at it. It's like, oh, yeah, just another tournament where I stand in the mats and do thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's very important, especially for the juniors, because um, mm. they can go in, have a really bad experience, and then and then that's it. But again, it comes across, I mean, nearly every club is doing something like this. Yeah. So if you don't do that and you send someone in, you're just, you're not giving them a chance, you know. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so. Uh, train plan, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly I, where I was going. Yeah, I plan my plan per season, so I, I um, or per term, should I say. So I have three terms, three, four-month terms throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would do a plan out for the entire um, term, uh, that, that entire term block. Mondays is our technical class. Thursdays is our sparring class. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's it's planned. I mean, there's so much to cover for, within the technical syllabus. But uh, most weeks we would do uh, patterns uh, on the Mondays and then um, a lot of leg strength and then in terms of fundamental hand techniques and fundamental kicking techniques there's sometimes that's kind of staggered so like maybe week on of hand techniques week on of foot techniques mm. um, etc but we would always cover patterns whether it's just we run running through the patterns uh, or learning the new patterns depending on where we are in terms mm. of your grading um, always always working on uh, leg strength uh, in that technical class as well uh, so wall work and that kind of thing mm. um, and um, we do do a lot of um, conditioning as well uh, within that class because sometimes in, in a technical class it doesn't always happen but sometimes you can uh, be in explaining mode and uh, you know people are they're learning, sure, but it's it's they're not kind of getting a bit of a workout in. So we would do a bit of conditioning at at the end, always to kind of make sure. You got that's some happening. sort of, yeah, that's cool. And uh, Thursdays is also is always uh, sparring, so that's um, yeah, that's a warm up, very quick warm up, 10, 15 minutes, and then it's usually usually gear on. Um, and uh, we do we do some drills, we do some game based uh, learning. And then we do some free sparring um, as well. I never really have more than uh, four groups. And when I, when I say groups, uh, in juniors, in terms of uh, four sets of two sparring at the same time. Oh, okay. So if we have a class of like 20 or 30, they'll be in smaller groups. And, that, and that's the free sparring component. Right. I tend not to like to have more than that uh, on the floor. Um for, for free sparring uh, for juniors just it can get uh, it can get chaotic and get messy and you, you're dealing with also 
in a junior class, well, if this is my junior class, I have a very a wide range of levels. Mm. Um, and have to be very careful uh, who you put people with uh, as well. Uh, you, you know yourself, it's a, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not the same with seniors. You don't just go to senior cages, take it easy. You say to juniors, that's fine, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So you just have to be very careful uh, what you do in sparring. Yeah, and, it, and are you the only instructor there? I mean, do you have people helping you in any sense? Have you got the, the sort of higher grades that are assisting you in the classes as well? Or Yeah, in Sligo now, which is, which is fantastic, we have, um, I have a couple of green belts and blue tags yeah. uh, who are helping out, uh, two cadets, um, one senior, and then we have a, a black belt, uh, well, he's a, he's a WTF black belt and he's now a black tag in ITF. So he's also helping out as well. It makes uh, a difference. It really does when you have extra eyes, even if nothing else. Extra eyes, very good for sparring. I, I find it very, very helpful, most helpful, to be honest, for the technical. You're able so to divvy like, out the grades or whatever. Yeah, because you just, yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. I just think, like, it's either that, and if you're on your own, um, and, and nobody is around. And like, it, it's a much, it's a much harder challenge with with juniors uh, mm. to teach them the technical syllabus. Do you know what I mean? It's like, can you just just stay there for a second while I teach you this movement in those hand the blue tags? You know, saying that to an eight year old, you know, yeah. it's not exactly. Yeah, it's not like with seniors where you can go, okay, you're a senior yellow tag, go practice John G while I work through the next parts for the higher grades. You know, and they kind of go, yeah, okay, I'm on it. Yeah, exactly. I it's, know. Yeah, it's it is difficult trying to find a way to 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 gamify pattern training, right? Which is very yeah. much like Mr. Byrne was saying, a closed game where you just have to kind of repetition, repetition. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's 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 good. Like in Sligo, we have a full a kind of a full time premises, so uh, we share it yeah. with the gymnastics club, and that's that's um, that's kind of where we we would have that squad training then as well, um, where, where we can pop in. We just have the kind of flexibility there. Yeah, yeah I mean, to that's, use that. that's cool. Nice. Like, because we're we're renting school halls, you know, yeah. and we're really grateful for them, and they're really fantastic venues, you know. Uh, but at the same time, you're 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 battling with a school and their yearly agenda and timetable. And, yes. Uh, now we have a really good relationship with our schools. Now there's a there's never been a you know we've worked out all the kinks over the first few years, you know, and we now know the agendas and how they run, and there's no grief there. It's really really good. But yeah. at the same time, there's days where you're like, oh, any chance I could get in on a Monday? No, I can't. Sorry. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just to do those extra sessions or whatever, you know, so you have to find another way around that problem. Um, I, I'm interested that you picked up on you have a patterns day and a sparring day. Mm -hmm. Have you got students that are exclusive to one day and avoid the other one like the plague? Uh, no, not really. I mean, there's people in who do come to our sparring class. Uh, who sometimes say, "Look, I, I'm not, I'm not feeling up to sparring. Sparring, I'll do the drills." You know, um, that happens the odd occasion. Most of the juniors, to be honest with you, spar no problem. Um, I don't really have people who only come to one day or another, and that's probably because I lay it out very clearly for anyone who's grading. You need to be able to do both. Like if if our students can't spar, they can't grade. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I say that I know sparring is a small component of the martial art taekwondo, but at the end of the day, you want to know, like, okay, sparring is the game, but it very much so translates to fighting. Like, you want to know how to move, uh, how to use your hands and use your feet, and you know, you want to know what it's like to hit things and be hit, and. It's not the same. I mean, I've I've had the situations outside when I was younger doing taekwondo where where I had to use taekwondo a few times. It's not the same, but it's definitely helpful. <laughs> yeah, mm, if you're mm. doing movements up and down the hall and not make any contact with anybody, you you don't know what it's like uh, to be hit, and you don't want the first time you get hit um, to be out uh, on the street in the dark when someone. Uh, you don't know is hitting you in an uncontrolled environment so you know and, and again nobody wants that to happen but you go to do martial art to learn how to uh, defend yourself and protect yourself in some way at the end of the day so i do think sparring definitely translates to that and if you don't spar uh, i just I don't, I don't think you can consider yourself a black belt um if you have uh, never sparred properly i i just don't i think you're kind of 
uh, it, it's taking away a very important part uh, of any martial art uh, is, mm. is that type of contact if you, yeah if you stay away from it so yeah so uh... Yeah, I lay down the law. I say you're not grading unless you can do those things. Uh, yeah. That's it. So they come to the classes. Yeah. And I suppose now, it's that... fun. It's fun. I don't stand there like an army tailor with a stick. Yeah. yeah, it's not that. It's not that. But in my head, that's in my head, that's what it is. The way I translate it though is like, you know, yeah, we gotta learn how to move. You know, it's it's a fun present. Um, it, it's presented in a fun way. It, it's it's not a case of turning them into a. Uh, lethal weapons uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and i suppose the, the the opposite is true right i mean it's not enough just to be a sparer right you need to have the holistic view of the martial art as well when you go to test you need to be able to understand your patterns you need to be able to perform the fundamental thing there's that tradition and there's the, the like you said earlier the art and there's the art side of martial arts i mean that's it's a uh, now especially when you're all locked away at home being able to rattle off a few patterns in your own time and, and have your martial art it's a really useful head check when For you sure. can't, you know, spar the cat or whatever, right? Um, yeah. Well, the, cat, the cat's pretty fast, so. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, now the technical, I, I, I was always really interested in the technical thing. I, mm. it's, I find it, when someone says to me, you know, I prefer this over that, I just think, I don't really get it. I, I don't really get when someone says they prefer one thing over the other. I'm just like, they're both cool. Like, they're, they're, there's different disciplines, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, you have to find the enjoyment. I, I guess um, uh, it, it kind of put an analogy on it. It's kind of like styles of music, you know. Like when when I went to to kind of music college, uh, started started playing jazz in second year, and I was like, ah, this sucks, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> I couldn't quite get my head around it for for quite a while. But then you know, you stick with it, you learn the rules, you learn the language, and then you know you start to enjoy it a bit and that's kind of what technical is because there's so many rules in it especially when you're when you're learning there's so many rules uh, lines and levels and you know it's like sine wave and half sine wave continuous motion and fast motion you've got all this stuff that they're trying to learn and that's harder uh, than moving around at the start and trying to score a few points right it definitely is there's a lot more in it you know mm. uh, but yeah yeah if you just stick with it i think uh, you'll you'll learn to Learn to love it for sure. The technical. Yeah, uh, I, I, I just re- like last year we went to uh, second dan, so we've been just uh, learning um, the second dan patterns. So the <laughs> all those bandes and uh, the juche. Uh, man, I should I should have <laughs> I should not have left at first dan. I should I should have kept going. Yeah. I wish I was younger for those man. Some, something yeah, else. that's it's it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a special place for that pattern. It's a. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, i mean it's i think it's my favorite pattern i'm not gonna lie I, I love it i'm not i'm nowhere near the performer of it that people would go with that's the benchmark juche there you know but yeah. i just i love the whole lot of it it's just for me it's it's there's everything about that pattern is taekwondo it's got the what we thought yeah sorry juche that's where we were before the camera died and went mad uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it is i think it's my favorite pattern i love it uh i love that high rotation i love that split kick i love i i, I mean it's everything about it is is it's just it's hard and it's fun and it's great, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I actually else. think Chung Jang is a harder pattern than, than yes. Juche. Yes, in just, terms of the mem- memory type thing, because it's so long. It's it's just all over the place as well. You're turning left, you're turning right. You, it's a it's a side kick. Is it a high? Is it an open? Is it close? Uh, it's it's just it's it's There's one of those very patterns. very strange stepping motions in that as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, the, the one where you go into this, uh, I don't even know exactly the name of it now, but you're, yeah. you're not stepping like it normally would. Yeah, there's some very strange stepping moves. Yeah. For sure. it's, it's good fun, though. It is. They're all they're really nice patterns. They, they become yeah. harder than for, for a tournament, right? Mm. Because you're, de- you're definitely getting one of them. And uh, I, I've been <laughs> around. Uh, I think I got I got Juche in second degree patterns before. You know, yeah. I think uh, against so, uh, Eddie Dillon or Jamie Williams, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> stand back guys watch out you know <laughs> so uh you know yeah yeah whatever, oh, whatever. Yeah. i was happy enough to get out and do what i needed for the test so um yeah but yeah it's it's um it's it can be it can be tough i think as a as a black belt um competing i mean i i've competed a few times now over the uh over the last few years since i come back mm. and uh i mean 
if it's just such, such, such a jump, you know, as soon as you hit first on black belt, it's just like, I welcome know, yeah. to the dark side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the, it's like the, 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 they talk about the jump from junior black belt to senior black belt being hard. And I think the jump from senior color belt to senior black belt is just, I don't even know if it's makeable unless you're at the standard there. That's, you know, if you've come in, it's, it's a, unless you've been a junior color belt, that just turned 18 maybe you know and went to black belt but even then i think that you're right the jump is i mean i often tell people the story that when i first went to first degree black belt i went sparring and the first match i got was adam shelley and oh, nice. uh, yeah yeah he was a nice guy I, i'm happy i punched him once so you know I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it's uh it's one of those things you're you're dead right the standard is so high and it's almost it's almost a success problem right that we have loads of black belts in the ITA and we don't have an awful lot of seniors competing. There's there's a, a group there that really are the top, that are competing for national spots, right? And, and they have to be at the top of their game. They're out there to compete for a spot and they're going to go and win that spot regardless. They're not there to kind of, it's not a game as much as it is, you know, a serious sport for them. So, yeah, I mean, you, I, I often thought they do well with a B, a B classification or a B division, but, you know, we, we get killed then with no, no having no umpires, you know? Yes. And that's that's I think why that's probably the biggest reason why we don't have a, a B black belt division sparring or whatever it is. That and time, right? We don't have the time or the umpires to to put yeah. on Bs. So I think everyone kinda hangs around, waits till they turn sort of veteran and then they go, Okay, maybe I can stump in there and maybe have a kick around with the vets where I'm yeah. not running the risk of coming across three time world champions. So well, nowadays you are, they're all just kinda moving off into veterans now. No my look <laughs> I go thirty five what five this year or something and hong will jump into that division for the crack <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I i'm 35 so i, I did vets there uh monster open i did the vets um mm. but it's still yeah i mean there's still there's some some very fairly fit and strong vets for uh, sure <laughs> absolutely i'm not i'm not trying to play down that division in any way <laughs> yeah. shape or form right uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, i suppose i'm just saying by by comparison to senior internationals it's you'd like to think that there's more there's more uh, opportunity there to sort of have a competitive match than just be kind of making up the numbers. I mean, may, uh, maybe there's scope. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know how many black belts there are that, that would want to compete, but maybe not at that, that level. I mean, if the, I mean, it can't be too hard. You get somewhere central, you get a hall for a day, you know, yeah. um, you have a black belt competition that's not focused on, I don't know, um, national team uh, kind of standard. I'm not. I'm not sure if that's that's a that's a great thing to do. But if people yeah. are black belts would like to do a bit of competing, but don't want to step up to that level, it's it's certainly something that mm. might work. I know? mean, the other side of it is, you know, taekwondo is very fair that way, right? You're either at the standard or you're not, you know. And if you're that's not, the, that that's kind of on you to go get there, right? Um. <laughs> It just that, that road true. might be harder than than it was than it, it would have been had you done the work ten years ago, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like so, I, I don't know. Maybe it's doable. Maybe it's not. I don't know if it's ever doable. Who knows? But it's a good problem to have, you know. Um, yeah, a success problem for sure. It is a good problem. Absolutely. Too many good people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we're <laughs> in such trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and it is. It's interesting. It's great to see. You know, I mean, it, it, it's great to see the standard of the tournaments go up and up and up. And I mean. Is that, is that is that your plan now to keep competing there going through on your i mean what's what's your your personal development plan because i know you said you know we've talked being instructor we've talked being club you know we've talked your your previous journey what's what's the future hold for you as a as a martial artist and not just as an instructor um so yeah um i enjoy my training uh, that i'm doing with uh, mr darty at the moment so my, i suppose keeping the training up uh, as much as i can um uh i guess my next goal really is uh, is fourth dan fourth dan to me is a quite a i don't know it's like first dan was like a big uh, step fourth dan mm. for me is in my head is another big step uh, so obviously i have to get the third dan first uh mm. but that that's kind of my my long term uh, goal Short-term goals, really, in between that is to make sure that I'm still stepping on the mats a bit in terms of competition. Um, just trying to keep fit. Um, 
yeah, not to, to try and be conditioned that I'm not getting injured. Uh, when I came back first, it was very funny. I did a sparring and kickboxing seminar uh, with Mr. Louis um, up in Dublin, the indoor arena where the, where the tournament was was mm. going to be. And um, I went in thinking I was, you know, 21. Uh, and I really wasn't. I pulled. I I got two massive injuries <laughs> from that. The uh, uh, hip was out of place for for months, and uh, had a really really bad um, uh, black eye <laughs> as well. So it was quite funny. But yeah, I learned my lesson there. It was like you need to be conditioned. You need to you know you need to do conditioning and that kind of thing. So I, I do regular do a bit of weight training and stuff like that just to try and keep the body from falling apart. So yeah, the goal is don't fall apart and hopefully hit for it then. That's that's the, the goal. Yeah. Nice. So that's nice there's a plan there, you know. Um yeah. it's always good. It's always good. Um so where here's a question I've been asking everybody and I'm gonna ask you as well. Taekwondo has become or it has not has become I say it all the time, but it is a traditional martial art where we all line up and we have the do book and it's very kind of regimented and structured and you know it has that perception uh, of, you know, almost like the 1980s martial arts films, right? Mm. Uh, and how do you think that a martial art like that, with a perception like that, is st- stays relevant in a, in the modern martial arts world, right? Because before you didn't know what went on in the dojangs, you do, you, unless you joined, right? Whereas now the internet makes everything exposed and visible and open to critique, right? So how do you how do you think taekwondo positions itself to stay relevant when there's the rise of mma and stuff like this and you know I, I, i'm curious what do you think taekwondo is in that sphere or how is it stay how does it what what's your thoughts on that one okay i mean i mean the traditional martial arts side of it's very important for um I mean, the, I mean the, the the tenets of taekwondo you know the moral code that's there i mean that isn't necessarily there I, I, I suppose I have to hold my hands up here. I don't really follow MMA, uh, and I don't really, I don't really. It doesn't really interest me that much, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, the athletes are, yeah, strong, cool, you know. But there's just too much, there's too much nonsense around it for me. Um, the sort of pre-fight build-ups and all that kind of stuff. I just just like ah, whatever. It uh, it doesn't do anything for me. Mm. Uh, the discipline, like of a traditional martial art, and uh, being dedicated and showing up and having the grit to actually keep going to get to the next level, whether it is to learn the, the next techniques or anything like that. I think there's a very important thing that that um, is getting depleted in our modern day society where everything is like instant, you know, mm. like it's, it, it's not, and I'm not saying becoming an MMA, um, you know, international athletes is an instant thing by any means. But if you look at a, look at a lot of them, they have come from a traditional side, you know, so a traditional side martial arts, and then they move into the MMA maybe to, to, to compete or whatever like that. Do you think that was um, just because there was the lack of kind of purpose-built MMA facilities, whereas now we're seeing that become more commonplace? Um... Okay, so I suppose what I, I would think that it is really about is about the money, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you go in there and you spar. Uh, I wouldn't say spar. You go in, you try and win. And if you win, you you get paid. So I think that's what it is. And l- let's just take, <laughs> like, if you were to take that monetary uh, weight and put it on a sparring match in ITF, uh, you'd have more people to become ITF professional taekwondo it, that's it. it's just about the money it's not about anything else nobody would go and necessarily do that for for free I don't think you know the, the, the end of it is 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 money right um that that that's what I would see um uh, I, I again with other martial arts I mean are, are you talking about jiu-jitsu as well or are you really just talking about just MMA? curious I mean the the perception of, uh, like I I I just wonder what people's feelings are on taekwondo because i sometimes feel like it could be in danger of being uh perceived as out of date or not uh not usable or not applicable or not relevant anymore you know and i'm just wondering how taekwondo advertises itself i suppose or positions itself in the modern yeah. martial arts world to say that no well, we are a relevant system and we are we have you know properties and characteristics that are valuable 
Well, I mean, I think the likes of things like TKD uh, Coaching Academy in New Zealand, mm. so I'm a member of that, and the Black Belt Project, and the likes of the content that um, uh, the um, uh, TKD, um, what's it again? Instagram. Um, okay. That's Mr. Mr. Ford's TK, and, uh, TKD Mr. Coach Ford. Academy, yeah, and TKD Coaching is the New Zealand one with Master McPhail. Yeah, exactly. So the likes of all that content, uh, I mean, this, that, 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 all that stuff is very, very relevant. Um, I mean, it comes out, everyone's seen the transparency of the martial art, they're seeing mm. the level. Um, I can't, I, I see, I suppose the question being, re- the relevant question, like, relevant in, in in today's world i mean what does that really mean mm. right so like if you if you're talking about relevance in a functional technique um i mean you're, you're going to learn how to punch you're going to learn how to kick you know that's going to be effective for if you need to use those tools um i'm not sure if that's really really what you mean in, in relation yeah. to that question yeah I, it's, it's more it's more of a thought experiment than it is a hard and fast uh how, relevance probably the wrong word you know um i think maybe all traditional martial arts have been tarnished by a brush of imposters do you know what i mean uh, there because there's an awful lot of rubbish out on the internet calling yes. itself certain things and i think that gets you know shared and that gets propagated and then that becomes the de facto truism around it right even though it's you know you stand that against, uh, you know, proper practitioners or, or skilled practitioners of the system, and it just becomes completely d- d- destroyed, right? So yes, I I, don't, I do understand what you're talking about because like I ITF Taekwondo, uh, it does not necessarily translate to the level that it's here in other countries or other places. Um, mm. But that's I think to do with the associations, and it's, that's their responsibility um, to make sure that the coaches are you know trained correctly and i yeah i i it filters down from the very top really uh, in terms mm. of keeping the martial art the the standard there um but yeah i mean i i, I don't i don't really know i never really dwell on it too much um, yeah. i i i enjoy taekwondo a lot uh, myself and yeah, I never really question whether it's relevant or not. It doesn't maybe, even come into... Maybe yeah. that's enough, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Like we said earlier, if you're not doing something you love, there's no point, so, I mean... But, like, yeah. do you think members would be would be going, okay, I think I, I might do MMA instead? Is that what you're kind of thinking? Like, they might hit, like, yellow or green belt, they're like, okay. Not yeah, even no, that. I think, I think, you know, new beginners from the, from the outset, right? Not so much mm-hmm. with kids and, and stuff like that. I mean, take one of the kids, it's fine, right? You know, I mean, parents will, will always put their kids in a dough book before they put them in a cage, you know? Um, <laughs> but, like, yeah, I just think uh, when you look at the sort of, you know, the, like, that's why when you said to me we were eight teenagers and we walked into this club, it's like, I just, I don't see, I don't see that happening nowadays as much, maybe, you know? And I, I wonder, is there a, a shift in mentality that you know you don't do the traditional martial arts you need to go to an mma club that does muay thai and jiu-jitsu to be a, a martial artist right and all that yeah. traditional martial arts they're all that's all I, we, that's all nonsense do you know what i mean i wonder is that sometimes the the perception you know and is it just because there are some really really bad videos on the internet you know <laughs> that this yeah. has come out but i mean uh, to me um it seems it seems kind of strange to step into a mixed martial arts scenario if you haven't got a, a good grounding in one martial art. I don't know. Mm. That that seems to me like jumping into the very very deep end where there's a lot of pain, a lot of possible pain, and having not really any idea what you're doing. I don't know. Uh, I guess it's it's now changed into the fact that you know they've taken them in from beginners and and working them through, but. Um, like, how does a mixed martial arts coach teach everything? Like, how can he be a great striker? How can be? How can he have a great ground game? How can he have all of that? All of those things? He probably can't. So he then has to get people in who do. So he gets either kickboxers in or that kind of thing, right? I mean, that's um, 
heard John Kavanagh there on the on the radio, and he was saying that you know that he gets different people in for striking and that kind of thing. So getting in different coaches. So maybe they're not learning going through the grades or that kind of thing, but they're still getting taught by those people. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a it's a, it's a good question, um, for sure. But it's a hard one to answer. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I spent a bit of time thinking about it. But look, it's neither here nor there. How about how about we answer some sort of more uh, easier succinct questions that are a little bit more rapid fire and just top of the brain answers relevant to Taekwondo. I've been doing this with a few people, just rapid fire questions. Feel like sure. playing? Yeah, cool. yeah. Uh favorite kicking technique. Bande Dolio Chaggy. Favorite hand technique. Uh this back fist strike, yeah, hundred percent. Uh, pattern you don't want to see on the board when you step onto the mats. <laughs> uh, I actually, I actually don't mind. I, I don't mind. No, I, I'm happy. Uh, any give, throw them up. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my next question answer too. Um, <laughs> well, so here's a nice one. Uh, there's three boards. You have to break them all. What technique? How oh, yeah, Chaggy. Mm, Safe. Solid. Yeah. Safe. Solid. Cool. Uh, what other ones have I got in my head? Ah, no, look, that's it's just sort of fun, nice, fast, easy, nice. T- so I mean, look, I've I've had really good fun having having chats with you about this. It's really cool, and I I'm glad to see new schools popping up around Ireland in the ITA as well. You know, especially out up in in Sligo, where you know we have to send you. We'll have to send you a, a bigger telescope so you can see the rest of us. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it's great that you're doing what you're doing. I think it's great to see the, the club so active and so successful on the circuit already. And I'm sure you'll have a, a, a really good future. And I look forward to kind of being in touch again. You know, it's been really, really good having a good chat with you. So, I mean, just for people who might be listening, how can people get in touch with you or how can they find you if they want to go training in Sligo, if they find themselves lost someday? Yeah, uh, yeah so um, Sligo TKD at gmail.com. Uh, that's the email address. Um, we're online. You just type in Sligo TKD or Taekwondo. You'll see us pop up on Google Maps. All the info's there. Website's there. Links to Instagram, links to Facebook. So literally Google search Sligo TKD. It all pops up. Give us a call. First class free. Um, come down. That's it. Yeah. There you 100%. go. You're up in Sligo. That's the place to go. Mr. Coleman, nice it's one. been a real, real good pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I hope you stay safe and look after yourself. You too. Cheers, Mr. Scott. Take Bye. care, sir. Cheers. Bye-bye-bye.